I think, therefore I am, building self-aware machines. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Hod Lipson, Professor of Engineering and Data Science and Director of the Creative Machine Labs at Columbia University in New York City. Welcome, Dr. Lipson. Pleasure to be here. Give us a brief summary of your resume, especially as it relates to AI and robotics. Oh, that's a tough, uh, that's a tough challenge. Um, I uh, work mostly in uh, trying to build both the bodies and the brains of robots. So we look at both manufacturing techniques, how do you print robots, how do you make materials that move and so on, but also how do you make the brains, the minds, and how do you put it all together uh, in ways that are inspired from biology. So that's, uh, we're really trying to recreate life and, and, and in a way do things that uh, you normally don't think about robots uh, doing, uh, not just lifting heavy things or, or moving around, but robots that can build other robots, robots that can repair themselves, robots that can uh, even uh, you know, think about themselves, be self-aware, create art, uh, be creative. So we're trying to push the limits of what it means to be a robot. In fact, you and a PhD student created a robot that modeled itself without any prior knowledge of physics or its own shape, and then used that model to perform tasks that detected self-damage. So let's start at the beginning. What does it mean to self-model? So, so what we're trying really to do there is to create a robot that's self-aware. And self-awareness is a very complex topic. People debate that for, for thousands of years, what it means and so on. But we took a very pragmatic uh, approach, which is a machine that can model itself, is self-aware to a degree. The fact that we humans are self-aware in large part means that we have an imagination where we can see ourselves. We can imagine ourselves doing something in the future. We can, uh, we can smell the sand, the ocean, and we can feel the sand uh, when we uh, walk uh, on the beach tomorrow, right? So we, we have this notion of self. And uh, to the extent that we can do this, we are self-aware. To if you can imagine yourself in retirement, and because of that you're saving today, it's because you're self-aware. These are all things that come with self-awareness. So we're trying to get robots to do the same. And practically speaking, if you think about it, most robots today, I, I would say all robots start their life in simulation. Uh, they don't. Uh, nobody builds a robot out of thin air and just hits enter and it works. It's always if there's planning, the simulation, and all that work is done inside a computer. And in this simulation, where this virtual world, that is always a human-designed environment. It's always the engineer that designs that simulator. And what we try, and, and there's always an engineer that, that makes the simulator, builds in all the physics, models the motors, models everything. And that's where the robot learns. And when it's ready, then you build it in the real world, and, and you hope it's going gonna, it's gonna to work well. And what we're trying to do is, is have the robot build that simulator. How did the robot in this project actually go about self-modeling? How accurately did it actually imagine itself? So we only have indirect knowledge on how it sees itself, right? So it's a very opaque system, just like any other machine learning technique. It's different. You can't just open the lid and see, oh, here's a little little robot uh, that uh, is a puppet of how the machine uh, thinks about itself, just like a human. It's very difficult to know how a human thinks about themselves. And probably we humans acquire our self-image, if you like, over our lifetime. We keep updating it and uh, we have different self-images for different situations, I think. Uh, you know, it's a very complex uh, question. The same thing with the robot. So it has a, it's basically a machine learning algorithm. It, it tries to connect sensations to actuations, actions to sensations. Basically, that's all it is. And it needs, like, if I move some, some uh, uh, if I do this, this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to feel. If I move my motors in this way, I'm going to feel a, a, a motion forward. If I'm going to move my motors in this way, I'm going to feel a twist. If I so, it's this at this point, it's a very sort of mechanical self-image. It's not long-term or anything like that. But it's it's a it's the same thing that you would get out of a physics simulator that some engineer would build. But this time, it's done done automatically. The nice thing about this idea is that once the robot has a simulation of itself, it can do anything inside the simulation, and, and then just uh, so if it needs to, let's say, I don't know, jump, 
It doesn't have to try to jump. It can jump in its head, if you like, in its imagination. Figure out how to move the mortars in order to jump best in its imagination, and then bam, it can just jump. And from the outside, this looks like what we call zero-shot learning, like a system that just out of thin air knows how to do something but, uh, without, being, without practicing. Uh, but in reality, practices in its imagination. And this is what we humans do all the time. We can appear to do things without practicing. Uh, but the reality is that we imagine it before. And this is really what we're trying to get robots to do. Interesting. Explain the pick and place experiment, both closed loop and open loop. How did it self-imagine allow it to, I don't know, complete the task? So, so we gave it the task to, to pick and place something. So that was the, we're, that's the, the external uh, uh, impetus to do that. And it figured out how do I move my motors in order to get from here to there, pick something up and, and drop it into the ball. So all of that was done inside that self, that simulation. And then it carried it out and it worked most of the time, which means that that self image, that self model was accurate enough to do the pick and place. And now it's important to understand that self simulation is not perfect. It's uh, even humans, we don't have a perfect model of ourselves. If you close your eyes and try to touch your tip of your nose, you're probably going to miss a little bit uh, because uh, maybe not you, but you know, most people, uh, especially if they've been drinking, right? This is a, is a, cl this is a classic uh, test of how good your self model is uh, because it's never perfect. So even for the robot, it's the same thing. The robot doesn't know exactly where its arm is going to be if it moves its motor in a particular way, but that self image that it has is good enough that it can do pick and place most of the time. Now, the difference between closed loop and, and, and open loop is whether you open your eyes or not. It's a lot easier to touch your nose when you have your eyes open because you can see the finger and you can correct. And it's the same thing. If the robot knows where the tip, where its hand is, it can correct its self model. It still needs a self model in order to move, but it's a little easier. Was the robot able to complete any other tasks? So the, the ultimate test of how good a self-model is, is can you use it for more than one task? Because if you can only use it for one task, you might as well have just did machine learning for that task and that's it. So the whole idea is can you do a new task you've never done before? So we just chose an arbitrary task, which is to move a pen in a particular, uh, you know, to draw the, the, the letter, you know, the word high, which is, uh, the simplest kind of, uh, you know, four strokes, four straight lines. The, the, it's what my son uh, does, the, the word he first wrote with a marker. So I thought it's a good, uh, a good uh, test. And, uh, uh, and we had the robot plan that motion based on its self image and it, and it worked uh, just, as, just as well. So, uh, it, and so, that's just a, an example of how that self image is useful for doing different things. What are the real world applications for this type of technology? I think that eventually all robots will work like that. This idea that we build a simulation of a robot, some engineers programs it and uh, creates that improves the simulation or when you have a new robot, some you have to create a new simulation from scratch, that's going to go away. Uh, what you do is you take the software, of the sort of we're developing, you pop it into that robot, the robot flails around like a baby in a crib for a while, and then it knows exactly what it is, how to move, how many, how many uh, degrees of freedom it has, uh, how, to, how not to collide with itself, I mean, all the, the, the things we take for granted, all of that will happen spontaneously. So I think it's, it applies for everything from driverless cars to uh, aircraft to factories to smart cities. I mean, you name it. Anything that we use a simulation for right now should and will be replaced by this kind of approach because it's the only way to scale. You can't have people, humans, engineers sitting down building simulations for everything. As we get more and more automated, there's more and more work to simulate everything. And simulators become obsolete and we, we get it wrong. And there's many reasons why we don't want to do that. How might AI and robotics offer us a new way to consider human consciousness? I mean, how, and, and, and what about the ethics, actually? The ethics of creating self-aware machines. Is that something we should be thinking about? 
Yeah, so that's the other reason why uh, we, we are really interested in this whole area is, you know, there's the practical angle, but there's also a deeper question, which is, you know, is this self-aware, is this consciousness, uh, is this sentience, really? I think the answer is yes. This is really what sentience is all about. This is feeling. This is emotion. And I can tell you how many times I give talks about robots, about robots that can detect emotion, can sense emotion, can fake emotions, can do all kinds of things. And then the next question is always, but can they have emotions? Can a robot really have real emotions? Not smile and pretend, but really have emotions. And I think that will happen. And it will happen only when the robot has a model of itself. So emotions are all about how we see ourselves in the future. Emotion is a prediction of what's going to happen to us in the future. If, if we feel like, you know, good things, bad things, long-term, short-term, it's all about predicting the future of ourselves. And, and this, is, uh, this is really uh, requires this ability to self-simulate. And, and uh, once robots begin to have their self-image that they derive, they will begin to have something that is similar to emotions. Is it going to be human emotions? Probably not, just like a, a cat has a different kind of emotion, uh, set of emotions than, uh, than a human, but it is emotional nonetheless and, and will we'll be in that sort of space. Dr. Hod Lipson, Professor of Engineering and Data Science, Director of the Creative Machines Lab at Columbia University in New York City. If somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, just send me an email, hod.lipson at columbia.edu. Uh, and uh, I'll get back to you. All right. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.